Okay, what does TAMC stand for? That'll be on the final exam. That's Tripler Army Medical Center. And, and we have the CEO of that huge in, uh, installation uh, up on the hill uh, overlooking you know, half, of, half of Oahu, um, Bill Salas. And um, I want to talk about uh, all the things that happen at Tripler with Bill. We want to know more about Tripler than we do. It's not just something you see on your right hand uh, when you're driving to Waianae. It's much more than that. And it's iconic and historical. Bill, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Pre appreciate you having me. I'm excited to talk to you. So you are um, a doctor and you're a combat doctor. Am I right? Yeah, but be clear, it's a doctor is a degree, but uh, I, I do have a doctorate degree, but I'm a physician assistant by training. Okay. And, you, and you've been in combat, combat situations? Oh, many, many times. Yeah. How, how is it to be a medic? You know, they, they call medic and it touches your heart in, in every movie and every circumstance. Uh, what's it like to be in, in the combat field as a doctor? Well, that's a, it's a, it's a good question. I didn't know. I mean, early on when I joined the army right after high school, so I wasn't really sure uh, what that experience would be like and never thought I would go to combat. Uh, so my first experience actually was, uh, was during desert storm. I was a medic during that time. I was in the 101st airborne division. And that was my first experience to go there. Uh, a lot of mixed emotions uh, going. You, you don't know if you'll be able to perform your job until you actually have to do it. Uh, but I, I did realize there was, um, uh, the training that we do, and that's why it's so important that the Army does its training, is that you you would respond and you will act to the highest level of training that you've done. And, and, when, and I remember being on the battlefield and taking care of people and con conducting my, even under fire, even nervous, even with anxiety, uh, that you will perform the way you trained. Uh, and so that was uh, my first opportunity, but obviously later on in my career, I had many more experiences. Yeah. And those troopers count on you, I mean, life and death for sure. Uh, when you're when you're a medic, do you carry a weapon? It, we we do. Yeah, every medic. I mean, unless you you file as a conscientious ob objector, uh, but the majority, majority of all the uh, medical forces, uh, medical soldiers in the army carry a weapon. Uh, they uh, uh, we well, follow the Geneva Convention still, of course, but uh, er every soldier carries a weapon. How do I get to be a medic these days? Suppose I'm, you know, I'm I'm a, the kind of person who would like to help others on the battlefield. Uh, what do I have to do? Can can anybody ask for a designator in um, you know as a medic? Sure, sure. The, the recruiters obviously are all over the country, and they're the ones that best to answer that question. But uh, I didn't know it existed until I went to the recruiter myself. Uh, but there's there's certain things that they look for to to let you become a certain MOS in the army. So there's a a test you need to take that everyone takes. It's called the ASVAB. And in that test, it, it's really general medical, not medical, general knowledge that you learn in high school, some science, some English and so forth. And as long as you score a basic level, then you, you would go into certain categories of MOS as they know that you could be able to make it there. Uh, but by all means, uh, you, you could come in and request to be a medic. Uh, if you meet the requirements, uh, they'll enlist you as a medic. And it's 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 a. Uh, um, a lot of vacancies, we should say, because it's the second largest MOS in the Army. Uh, MOS is Medical Occupational Specialty. Uh, so the number one, meaning the largest, is the infantryman. Uh, number two is the combat medic. How interesting. We care about our troops. It's true. So uh, let's talk about Tripler for a minute. Tripler is, uh, what, a little over 100 years old now. Is was created uh, right after World War I in 1920, I'm guessing, I'm thinking. Um, and it, uh, and then it was, you told me before the show that it was built to its current size in 1948 after World War II. Uh, so it is kind of a reflection of the wars, uh, not necessarily during the war, but right after the war. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. how big, how, how big, how deep, how, how much, you know, what, what is the size and scope of the Tripler Army Medical Center facility? Yeah, it, it transitioned over the years. Obviously, uh, I did some reading on it myself when I before I came here to take uh, command of the hospital. Uh, and, and you're right, during the wars is what what sparked uh, the interest. And when I had saw that, uh, you know, Tripler Hospital, you're right, 1920, it was Tripler General Hospital, which was declared on Shafter, and it was only like three or four wooden buildings over there at the time. Uh, and it, and then after World War II, uh, during World War II, we we had to uh, have some capability of all the casualties coming back to the island. What they initially did is out at Schofield, they they built the hospital out there. 
Uh, not, not too many people know that, uh, but it was a big hospital. What they realized is all the casualties coming in from the Pacific on the ship uh, were right over here. Uh, and, and the transportation to get them all the way out to Schofield to care for them was logistically a challenge. Uh, so a lot of the casualties then, then started going to the civilian hospitals you know, within the uh, closest to the port. Uh, and they realized at that point they de they they built they started building Tripler and they descoped the the hospital uh, out at Schofield. Uh, so in 1948, you're right, is when they opened up the 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 current Pink Palace as you see today, uh, and uh, the capacity there was was uh, was large. Uh, what it transitioned in today, uh, and like I said, it's the largest uh, medical center, uh, tertiary medical center in the entire Pacific. Uh, it supports all of the uh, all of the uh, military forces in the Pacific. They're, all the little medical treatment facilities out there will, will use us as a referral hospital. Uh, and, and it takes care of every medical, uh, I mean, every military uh, service that's here in Oahu. So not just Army, even though we're an Army center, we take care of all services here. Mm. Including the retired and the Veterans Administration and all that? Yeah, so so the, what we call our beneficiaries, those we, who we care for, number one is our active duty population. So every service of our active duty population uh, their family members, uh, and then the uh, our, our our retirees, wh whether that's a 20 year plus retiree or, or a medical retiree, will, will be our our beneficiary. And those in the in the Veterans Administration only if they're a beneficiary for another reason. So uh, we have dual status: those who are retired from the military or medically retired from the military are also seen by the Veterans Administration, but they're also dual beneficiaries of us. Uh, so it. It's a large number of beneficiaries. Uh, I was I was told once uh, that one fourth of uh, the population of Oahu is a beneficiary of our hospital. Wow! I mean, what, what, one out of four. One out of four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, is this going to change as far as the veterans are concerned when they open that new facility for the veterans? Um, you know, down in uh, Waianae somewhere. I don't know exactly where. It's it's in uh, in construction right now. Oh yeah, yeah, it's that is definitely needed. I mean, obviously, our veteran population is, is large and getting larger as those who uh, serve here and want to stay here in the island. And, and don't blame them. Uh, currently, we we are combined with the VA. The veteran administration actually is in one of our wings, uh, administration, and then behind our hospital, there is actually an outpatient clinic that's there. Uh, obviously, at, at capacity, we have more um, beneficiaries. The VA has more beneficiaries to take care of. And then also we want to uh, care for our population to where they live. And that makes a lot of sense for them to open the clinic out there to be closer to where the veterans live. Uh, we, we have our outpatient clinics as well. So uh, Desmond Doss Health Clinic, it's out at Schofield Barracks, you know, falls under Triple Army Medical Center. So we support that population out there. And they also have a, a, a Warrior Ohana uh, clinic that's on the other side of the island as well. So we try to do the same to be closer to our beneficiaries. So... Um... Can you give me some stats on how many patients you serve, say, in a given year, how many doctors and staff you have? When you when you drive up to Tripler in the morning and you look at this enormous structure and you say, ah, it's all mine, and, <laughs> I, and I manage all of this, how big is, is, is the force you have to manage? Well, it's it's approximately uh, four thousand people, four thousand employees. You know, half are military, half half are civilian. It, it is massive. Uh, it, it's a huge training facility as well. Over twenty eight specialties we do in here. We we train you know surgeons, internal medicine doctors, radiologists, uh, you, you name it. A large uh, um, training platform. A, a lot of people. So I, it, it's the uh, it's the government's hospital, United States Army hospital. You know, Defense Health Ag Agency's hospital, not. Not mine. I'm just privileged enough to to lead the people that are there, and, and it, it is a blessing to me uh, to come in there every day and 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 help support people, uh, solve problems, and making sure that the uh, the patients are cared for. Uh, what what a a great place to work, and I'm excited to go there every day. Yeah, I would be too. Yeah, it sounds like a great job, actually. Um, I'm not going to follow your career track. That that's <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> so, so there's there's one point I, I would bring up. It was really interesting, and not not too many people know that. But you know, you mentioned the the staffing there. A, a lot are civilians, and a lot of those civilians are are all our community. Uh, but those who who serve with the military, a lot of people didn't know civilians can work with the military, but they do. Uh, but all of them take the oath just like we do. So when they're when they're hired into their job, and they say they take the job before they start work, they they raise their right hand and they 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 you know swear or affirm that they will support the and defend the Constitution of the United States, and so they're they're bought in. They're they're not just here 
to to serve the patients that they're serving in front of them. They're they're serving their country. They're serving the the, the military uh, and our way of life. We want that, Bill. We want them to be faithful to the country, no matter what. Yeah. Um, let's take a look at some of the slides that we have, some of the pictures we have, which is all off your website. Uh, looking at the hospital, you can describe it. There's an entryway. Is that the main entry? Yeah, that, that is the main entrance. It's kind of a, a way the hospital is built. If you can see the design from you know from the sky, you can see we're right up against the mountain. And so that's how we describe the entrances of our hospital. There's two entrances. There's the ocean side, as you see, the, the one that faces there as you're looking. And there's also the mountain side, and that's the back end uh, of it. Uh, so there was major renovations that was done, too. You know, 1948 is when it was built. Uh, however, you knew back then we didn't have central air. We didn't have a, a lot of things. So the way the hospital was designed on the mountain was for the wind to blow over the mountain, to blow through all the windows of the hospital uh, to cool the hospital off. Uh, so since then, obviously, a lot of construction taking place. The uh, the back end of the building was was uh, 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 expanded, uh, and so the night I believe it was 1985 is when they did a major renovation, uh, which uh, I mean they did a tremendous job of, of you know obviously giving us AC and uh, creating more uh, clinics, floor space, operating rooms. Uh, it's a really really uh, huge hospital and and really well uh, um, constructed. Well, it sounds like the federal government has made significant investment in the hospital, and, it, and it's here to stay. And we talked before the show about the new Fitzsimmons. Uh, I, I call it new, but the old Fitzsimmons preceded the new Fitzsimmons, and that's right near, near Denver. And it was a big hospital, um, the same kind of pink palace design as in mm -hmm. Tripler. Uh, but um, uh, 20, 30 years ago, they retired it. I guess there, there weren't, you know, it wasn't the same kind of demand for medical services in that part of the country. Right. And they, they made it into a, um, a tech center uh, under the Department of Commerce, but it is reminiscent of Tripler. It's so interesting. And, and the question I put to you is, you know, is, is Tripler here to stay forever? You know, within a reasonable look into the future, mm -hmm. I imagine that Tripler is going to be around. No matter what happens, we'll always have Tripler. Am I right? Uh, I, I would agree with you. It is not going anywhere. Now, uh, it, you, you have, we talk about the years, we talk about Fitzsimmons. Uh, I, I can tell you, Tripler is the is the oldest uh, hospital currently in the inventory. Uh, so, so there is plans to to build a new Tripler. Uh, it, it's not they're not in stone yet. We still need to decide on the location if it's going to still be here in this complex or, or somewhere else. Uh, the size and scope that it's going to be, uh, but but they're they're working on a replacement because they're uh, as you I'm sure you know uh, talking to many people in the community the infrastructure issues uh, on the island when we're talking about the. You know the water pipes that need to be re redone, and then the way the the hospital was designed in 1948 really doesn't uh, set with the standards of how we build hospitals today. Uh, you know the size of the rooms and the uh, you know the the hand washing, the amount of sinks, and the uh, all of those uh, standards of how to run a hospital with good quality and safety. But we really need a new hospital to be able to do that. Uh, so there are there are plans there. Tripler is here here to stay. It, it will continue to support uh, all of the you know, Department of Defense throughout the entire Pacific. Uh, a very important uh, location for us to have a major medical center. Yeah, for the now for the doctors, um, you know, I I trust that the doctors can do their residency uh, at Tripler. You have lots of specialties. You have, I would say, every specialty, right? And, and uh, twenty eight. <laughs> okay, that's all. Right. And you have all this equipment, um, you know, including some high tech equipment, um, uh, MRI, that kind of thing. Uh, and so you're as well outfitted as any hospital in Hawaii, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely compared to you. And we're also a level two trauma center. So on the island, Queens Hospital is the, on, is the only level one trauma center by American College of Surgeons on the island. We, we're considered a level two. Uh, and uh, so we see trauma. We do all the all the same things. A lot of the specialties, just like any other major medical center, uh, and the the uh, some of the specialties that we bring here, meaning the providers that the Army provides, are, are sometimes even above and beyond anywhere of the civilian hospitals. Uh, they're particular when it comes to pediatric uh, subspecialties and the neonatal intensive care unit we have. Uh, it, it's actually even beyond uh, some of the uh, capabilities that the other hospitals on the island have. In reverse, they have some things that we don't have as well as one of the hospitals is a burn unit on, on the island where we're not a burn unit. We can do the initial resuscitation, but should transfer them over. So we, we share resources. I, I'm in collaboration with every CEO on the island 
and, and we collaborate and, and we're making sure that we're together as one team, particularly in national disasters that we need to respond together. Obviously, the COVID uh, pandemic, we worked uh, closely and well together and, and we do every day. Yeah. So we talked uh, earlier before the, the show began about the difference between medicine and when we call it combat field medicine. Can you describe the difference in terms of concept and in terms of practice? Wow, that's a that's a huge, uh, huge uh, question there. Ho hopefully I can capture it in a, in a few words, if not take up too much of the time. But everybody truly understands what, what we do in a hospital. Obviously, it's regular. It, it's uh, it, 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 they, They've been to the doctor before, and some people maybe have had surgery. It's very structured. You have uh, tons of resources. You have plenty of time. You have plenty of light. Uh, you have plenty of help. Uh, everything is in ideal situation as it can be. Uh, the battlefield is totally opposite than that. Uh, you're going to have unlimited resources, not ideal time. It could be at night. You could be on the ground. People could be shooting at you. Uh, there's totally different environment. Uh, and so with those different environments, we, we need to be able to train our soldiers. The soldiers are the ones who need to adapt to those two different environments. One, you work in the hospital to maintain your medical skills. But, but then two, you need to develop all these other skills to do things that uh, that, you, that you wouldn't even be allowed to do here in the hospital, but you need to do on the battlefield in order to save lives. Wow, that's that's interesting and exciting. What what was the the, the slogan we talked about uh, about keeping keeping the blood? What what's that? Point oh yeah, reference. Yeah, you know, this is one of the the things is to keep the blood in the body, right? So that's you know we talk about innovation. That that's one of uh you know the the military medicine is one of the great innovators to medicine overall. A lot of the things that uh, you know te uh, uh, tactics and and techniques and, and new. Uh, innovation procedures for in our hospitals today we learned it during a war you know during you know all the way from every war you look back from washing our hands to uh, doing a particular surgical procedure developing triage on who we should treat first and uh, uh, surgical techniques all those things uh, there's a lot of innovation that comes out of conflict um so so the last our last 20 years you know we've, we've been in combat uh, over in the middle east so the, that that keeping blood in the body is you know comes from one of the you know, things that we relearned is to use a tourniquet. Well, we, we've always always had tourniquets in our inventory back in the other days, but they weren't really uh, efficient tourniquets, ones that actually work. And, and also in, in medical training, uh, they used to teach everybody that's your last resort. At uh, first, you're supposed to just like put pressure on it, uh, then you should elevate it, uh, then you put a pressure dressing, and then the last uh, the last cause you're supposed to put a tourniquet on. Well, every you know everything's turned on that. Now we know. That the first thing you should do is put a tourniquet on when you have massive bleeding in order to keep the blood in the body uh, as quick as possible to, you know, for survival. Uh, and so all medical training, and, and to include myself, when I first came in as a medic, uh, and all physicians, nurses, everybody learns what they call the ABCs. It was airway, breathing, circulation. So when they go and learn CPR, they do, do BLS, everybody was burned in their mind, and that's what you're supposed to do. Well, the, 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 uh, the early 2000s, when we realized that you know people were dying on the battlefield, the same way they died during Gettysburg, same way they died during the Korean and Vietnam War, is that they were bleeding out. Uh, but with new technologies, we were able to, you know, do the research and realize that, you know, we need to stop this ble bleeding before we worry about their airway. Uh, so now, even in our basic, uh, even here on our EMS trucks and in the hospitals, even in the current Red Cross training now, one of the first things you do is check for massive bleeding before you check the airway. So it's, yeah. it's a parad paradigm shift. It, it changed uh, the way we practice medicine, and it was learned uh, from the battlefield. Yeah, it's very interesting. So you're training people at Tripler. Uh, what can you describe the training programs you have there? Yeah, so, so training is exactly what we do is it's uh, and we have a different name for a hospital. We we call it our healthcare readiness platform. Uh, so essentially, it's a military term for this is where we we do our training to prepare for war. Uh, so. If we have these uh, lists or tasks, they're called individual uh, uh, critical task lists. And these individual critical task lists essentially is the task that you should be able to do uh, on the battlefield. And every specialty will have their own list that they need to perform. So some of those can get done inside the hospital just by seeing their regular uh, patient care. Uh, their you know, surgeons perform surgery. They're getting those tasks done. You know, medics are, are doing evaluations and learning how to take care of the sick and ill. The nurses are doing the same. So a lot of that's done there, but there's a lot on that list that is not done in the hospital or, or that the, the illness or injuries are not there for us to actually to, to do. 
so we have two things that we do. One, we have a, a, a large simulation lab uh, that where we have the state of the art, uh, you know, cameras, patient simulators, models uh, you know, that, that actually talk to you, that bleed. Uh, and then we have all these scenarios that actually we can uh, uh, mimic as best we can what the casualty will look like on the battlefield. So we'd be able to get competent within that skill. Uh, we also do it outside the hospital where we're doing it more in an austere environment where the medics are on their hands and knees on the ground uh, and they're covering for fire. And we're, we're putting them in the situation of not just treating the casualty, but putting them under stress that, hey, we need to move to this new location. Uh, a bomb just blew up over there. Somebody's shooting at you. Uh, in order for everybody to understand that this is the environment that you're going to have to do your task in. Wow. Oh, wow. So, um, gee, this sounds like medical school. Uh, are, are you uh, also exchanging uh, staff resources with the John A. Burns School of Medicine, aside from the hospitals themselves? Oh, yeah. yeah. So there, there we do have collaboration on there. Mainly, I know in research, our nursing programs are pretty well together. We, we accept residents from, from other places, not just the military, uh, to include the VA there, as far as the physicians. So they go through our, our normal programs as well. Um, the uh, research is really, and so we, we collaborate with the uh, University of Hawaii, as well as the um, Uniform Services Medical School. Uh, and these research, uh, uh, working with the residents as well, especially those in infectious disease, uh, work work on helping us innovate too for the future. Uh, they they go out to the Pacific and a lot of different islands. Uh, they research on you know all the things that cause diarrhea, for instance, uh, that can be a, a huge problem to military forces who deploy in the Pacific. Uh, we we learned a lot of that before, you know, you know during the the World Wars, and and uh, it's definitely not. Uh, has not gone away, and we still need to be able to to look at that. So we we call that uh, uh, DNBI, and that that stands for uh, dis disease non battle injury. Uh, if if uh, our service members are deployed and get sick, uh, then 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 they can't fight, right? So that's what uh, Army medicine is there for: is to conserve the fighting strength to to get them back into the fight. So it's just important to learn uh, medicine and to fight disease as it is to learn trauma skills. Well, it strikes me that you have a huge constituency, um, you know, probably more than any other medical facility in the state anyway. Uh, and having a huge uh, constituency gives you a, a special advantage in, in gathering and analyzing data for research. Um, so uh, I imagine if you have thousands of patients, the data on any given disease or condition can be very valuable to researchers at JAPSM or elsewhere. And I wonder if you do share that, because that could be, um, you know, a critical point for modern medical research, no? Yep. yep. So that, Max, they're on my calendar, I, I believe, tomorrow. I think I have a tour over there, and we have a meeting where we collaborate. Uh, once every quarter, we, we get together and talk. So that's, uh, that's definitely what you're describing actually happens. So let's talk for a moment about COVID, you know, because COVID involved uh, research and getting a handle on exactly what this thing was on an epidemiological basis. Uh, and I imagine you have treated a lot of COVID patients. You may still be treating them. Uh, what was your role, you know, uh, Tripla's role in dealing uh, with COVID as it, as it existed, as it still exists uh, in, in Hawaii? Yeah, the, obviously taking care of our patients. That, that was number one. We wanted to save, save as much lives as possible. So that was uh, taking care. And I tell you, we didn't, we didn't do it alone, right? It was a community effort. Uh, to, to know what the census of, of of all the available beds and providers and nursing nursing staff throughout the entire island, uh, that was the that was the easy part I would say is be able everybody just taking care of patients. That's what they normally do. Uh, the really challenge was when it comes to logistics, right? Because we live on an island, uh, you know the the supply chain managed coming from the mainland. Whether we have the right uh, uh, supplies, medications, you know dressings, tubings, uh, oxygen. All those different things really had to be looked at and realized and planned for uh, if we had enough, we we're going to run out and, and how do we get all of that? Uh, so that was more of a challenge than, than actually uh, caring for, for patients. Uh, testing is where, where the military really uh, did some state of the art. Work. And, and again, we, we weren't just taking care of our population here on the island. We were taking care of the entire Pacific. So a major testing facility here that was, was able to... Uh, um, not just uh, do the regular testing of COVID, but also the variants that were coming through, uh, uh, tagging those and sharing that data, uh, you know, throughout the island, our civilian partners to well the military. Another thing I, I wanted to discuss with you, something we touched on before the show, is the, is the, uh, the, the, the doctor shortage. Um, you know, Josh Green uh, soon 
soon to be our governor, was on Think Tech an hour or two ago, and I don't know if we talked about it then, but I'm sure he's very interested in the doctor shortage. He talked about it in the course of his campaign. And I wonder how the, the, the um, doctor shortage affects Tripler. How has it affected Tripler? How is it affecting Tripler? And what are you doing about it? Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. Yeah, that's a, it's a, a problem throughout our entire country, you know, not, not just here on the island, but also on the, on the mainland. We, we've always had a, a physician shortage. Uh, and and even greater, I would say, nowadays is a nursing shortage. Uh, we, we felt that uh, very, very much during the, the COVID crisis, even more than the physician shortage, is a nursing shortage and the support staff to be able to take care of them. Uh, I, I believe we have it a little harder because of our, our hiring process or how we bring people uh, into, you know, as I described before, we, we have military uh, uh, providers there and we also have civilian providers. Uh, so there's a, an HR process, uh, how we get the civilians in. And sometimes it, it, uh, we, we have to go through different loops and we don't always uh, pay as much as the uh, as our other competitors might be on the island. So we we have a challenge with that um, to to get those providers on. We're, we're able to sustain because our military providers, you know, we we pay them and to be in uniform, and we can move them onto the island to kind of help us out to fill those uh, those gaps. So uh, the best way we we deal with it is we communicate with our hire. We we have reach back to uh, to our higher headquarters and to the island. And, and now with uh, with our ability with the Defense Health Agency, uh, I'm not sure if you're, you're tracking that. Is the uh, that that kind of brings all of our services together? Uh, so the Army, Navy, and Air Force, who will all have medical services, we're, we're all under as far as the medical treatment facilities are all under Defense Health Agency now. And because of that, we can gain full resources from from all services uh, to be able to fill our, our gap and our our challenges that we're having uh, with all capabilities and not not just physicians. All that considered, Bill, what would you say um, your primary challenge or challenges are in managing this very dynamic, very important facility, a facility that has such huge moment for the military and the state and the Pacific? Um, what do you worry about at two in the morning? Well, yeah, I'm worried about change. That change is going to happen in the middle of the night. So how I get ahead of that, I mean, I, I look, uh, I try to look around the corner. I try, I try to predict it. And the way I do that is is by communicating. I, I communicate a lot uh, up and down and left and right. I, I make sure that uh, you know I, I create an environment with the staff that it's free to open up and 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 say any concerns that they might have because uh, that's what helps me get ahead of a crisis. Uh, if I know that there's a problem there ahead of time that I can fix, that I can resource, uh, that I can uh, talk with partners about. Uh, and that's what helps me get ahead of, ahead of the game. So when, when I'm when I'm out of the hospital, right, or if I'm uh, if I'm sleeping, yeah, yeah, that that's uh, <laughs> that's the 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 only time where there's a, I feel that there might be risk. But uh, the more I communicate, uh, the more it helps me uh, uh, look around the corner uh, so I can react to change. So change is the biggest challenge. Yeah, and you got to stay in touch with it certainly. So this, you know, this this doesn't sound so much like a military billet. As a, as a civilian billet, as the manager of a huge medical facility, and um, you know you're you're a bird colonel. Um, it sounds like you're doing the work of a three star. That's just me speaking. <laughs> <laughs> What's your future career look like? I mean, how long can you stay as uh, as the you know, leader or the commanding officer of Tripler? Uh, wh where does that interplay with retirement? Uh, where does it interplay with um, you know promotion and um, you know changes? Permanent station. Uh, it's, it's a lot, a lot of there to unpack there, there Jay. I, I can tell you the uh, November second that just passed it was was my anniversary uh, coming in the army. Uh, I, I just went over thir thirty five years uh, being wow. active duty, and uh, I, I tell you, I'm I'm thinking about making it a career. What, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> it's too early to tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm 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 hoping I'm hoping to make it a career, but. I've uh, I've had a, a tremendous career. I spent 10 years in, enlisted, like I said, as a medic and a nurse uh, before I got commissioned a, a, as a PA. You know, I spent 25 years actually doing that. I, I have tons of great opportunities and experiences. I, I traveled around the world. I, I, I worked five years at the White House Medical Unit and, and uh, met a tremendous amount of people there and, and tremendous amount of responsibility. I was able to, uh, you know, command another clinic and uh, command a special operations unit uh, when I was at Fort Bragg. I, I've done, and, and I'm in a dream assignment here in, in Hawaii, leading leading and working with, with great people. So 
um, great, great career. And, and uh, I, I'm going to stay in as long as I'm, I'm having fun. That was a, a deal uh, my wife and I had. Uh, as long as I'm happy what I'm doing, I'm, I'm giving back to, uh, to my community and to the military. I, I get to develop others every day and, and, and provide leader development. It, it gives me energy to do that. Uh, so as long as I'm doing that, as long as I, they will keep me, uh, I, I will stay. So the, the great thing about it is that I, you, you can stay in the Army for 30, 30 years active uh, federal commission service. Uh, so that 10 years that I have as enlisted doesn't really count against that limit. Uh, so I really only have 25 years as an officer. So really, I could stay another uh, another five years uh, before I have to get out. Wow. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm sticking around to have fun. Um, if the army you know, sees it uh, to to promote me, I'll I'll gladly you know take that and stay in. Uh, but if not, uh, you know I'll I'll hand it to the next generation and, and I'll continue to support the, the military and community and in, in civilian life. Oh, what a great career! No kidding. And I and I want to ask you this too because you know people on the outside they don't really understand a, a sort of a bifurcated position uh, that you have. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if you could identify some. Some of the traits, some of the the, the world viewpoints that you carry around with you that have made you successful in this, you know, this complex uh, MOS. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, what what do I have to do? What do I have to know? What kind of attitude? What kind of traits should I cultivate in myself to get your job? <laughs> well, that's uh, again a big big question there, Jay. It's a uh, I didn't know it all. I, I, I could I could tell you I don't know it all today either. But I could tell you I, I developed as I came up in, in the army. Uh, I, I learned a lot uh, from other people. Um, I was you know coached, teached, and, and mentored uh, uh, to get through some tough times. I, I, that development helped me become the person I am today. Uh, and I, I become I became very humble and realized that uh, the more uh, the more humble I am, the more I can learn. How I got these positions is really because other people recommended me for them. I didn't go out and seek them. Uh, it it kind of just uh, it kind of just happened. Um, so uh, what I would advise other people how to get the job or how to be successful, I, I would say you know you know uh, you know be positive, um, take care of other people, uh, be humble, do do well at your job, you know take care of your boss, take care of other people, um, do only the things that that make you happy. Uh, th th those, that's what gets me through life. So uh, it, it's it's helped me. It's worked for me. That's 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 how I got where I'm at. It, it's just by being a, a humble leader and, and, and serving others. Very gracious. Thank you very much, Bill. Bill Salas, the commanding officer. I guess is that is that the right uh, nomenclature? Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of titles now. Commanding officer, director. Uh, there's a you CEO. Right? There's a a lot of different jobs that I'm doing. Uh, they say you're, you're dual headed, triple headed, uh, but but it's fun to work it all out. And a nice person. I really enjoyed this <laughs> conversation with you. Thank you so much for sharing all this this incredible wealth of life at Tripler. Thank you so much, Bill. And thanks for having me, Jay. Aloha. Hello. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.